Welcome to Eye on Horror, the official podcast of iHorror.com. This is episode 75, otherwise known as season four, episode 18. I am your host, James J. Edwards, and back with me again, I guess I can't say for always and forever because he missed it, but we've got Jacob Davison back. How you doing, Jacob? Jacob's Revenge. I'm back for the sequel. <laughs> Jacob 2, Electric Boogaloo. This is cut. Uh, but yeah, no, it's good to be back. October was crazy busy, as it was for all of us, but uh, good to be back on the show and to talk uh, all things spooky. We, we missed you, but we did have a good uh, replacement with Heather because she was oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, also with us is your other, other host, John Korea. How you doing, Korea? I missed Jacob so much, and I'm just so <laughs> happy for him to be back. I mean, don't get me wrong. Loved Heather. Heather's great. She's definitely coming back for a future episode, but she's got to come back when you're back, Jacob. You can't, yeah. can't leave us again, man. That hurt. I'm sorry. It'll never happen again. <laughs> did you, I'm, I'm sure, Korea, you have, but did you hear um, Bree and Kelly's newest podcast? It's all about body horror and effects. They should have had Heather on their show for that. <laughs> yeah. They had a couple of other guests, though, so it would have been a full kitchen, but um, yeah, that, that would have been terrific. So um, we're recording this the day after Halloween. So how was your guys Halloween? Oh, I had a fun time. Uh, kept it kind of casual. Uh, just went to a friend's place. Uh, we watched uh, some horror movies and we passed out a bunch of candy to kids and we were in costume and we took a bunch of pictures. So, oh, and we also got a bunch of, uh, got a bunch of pizza. So that's always good. Wait, and- wait, wait. You got trick or treaters, like multiple trick or treaters came to the place you were at on Halloween. Yes. yes. Like how? Like how many more? Like five or six, or like was it more? Oh, we we had a bunch, and like of all ages, like there were kids from like I don't know, like five to fifteen, maybe. Listen, I've been living in L.A. for over seven years now, and last night was the first time I've ever had a trick or treater come to the house that I was at, and it was just one guy who was like probably a freshman in high school didn't care we gave him all the candy <laughs> but that they, like i've never had your treaters and i am i want to give candy like i want i don't need this in my house but they never come to my any of my residences like well i mean i was uh like i said i was visiting a friend in uh north hollywood and their house uh got trick-or-treaters because it was more of a neighborhood i'm in valley village i'm just down the street <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. Yeah, and if we had a great triple feature, I wanted to emphasize, uh, we watched the WNUF Halloween special, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and the Lost Boys. Ooh. Did you do them in that order? Because Rocky yes. Horror should have been last. Uh, well, that was the <laughs> order, but yeah, you know, it's either way, it's fun. Um, I actually just hung out and I watched some I Know What You Did Last Summer on Amazon Prime for reasons that will become... Uh, crystal clear in the second half of this episode or are clear to you if you read the title list before you hit play uh, <laughs> um what have you guys been watching i saw something just after we recorded last and i'm hoping you both have seen it because it all it was already vaulted into my top five and every time i think about it it gets higher on my list of the year last night in soho you both yes. see yes did you see it korea no i've been oh, busy with work oh people need to be COVID tested it is so freaking good it is um i mean it's edgar wright who's already a very stylish filmmaker and it's just the the spooky ass ghost story with like a lot of giallo influence yeah 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 a lot of yeah it's oh it is it, it's just stylish and it's one of those movies that like you're not sure where it's going but when you get there you're like oh yes Ooh, you know yeah yeah it's oh it's so good yeah no it was great and i was very lucky because i got to go to the special pre-screening at the uh american cinematech and um yeah so it was uh last tuesday and Ed- and uh edgar wright was there and so was um thomas and mckenzie you know the lead actor and uh the co-writer christy wilson carnes and on top of that we all got the uh seven inch vinyl of on on a taylor joy singing downtown in both up note and down note nice you know it's weird because seeing the commercials for last night in soho i kept hearing like three notes and I thought it was downtown and it was it's barely there. And I'm thinking that would make a great slowed down, you know, a horror movieified version of that song. So it didn't really surprise me when I showed it, it actually <laughs> bummed me out because I was kind of like, 
I wanted to do that version of the song, <laughs> but she did it better than I could anyway. But the music is amazing too. Oh because yeah. Edgar Wright knows how to drop a needle. That dude, I mean, he does. He, he, he his music taste is impeccable. And he's, you know, Thomas and Mackenzie's character is basically infatuated with like 60s British pop. So you've got, you know, Peter and Gordon and, you know, Petula Clark in there. I mean, and it makes sense in the context of the story because, you know, just, you know, I, I don't even want to talk about it too much because it'll spoil stuff. But yeah, it's uh, last night. So is incredible. Yeah, I love that soundtrack so much. I actually got the vinyl. Which one, the soundtrack or the score? Because Mondo's putting out both. Yeah, that well, that was the thing. They were selling the uh, soundtrack at uh, the screening. They didn't have the score yet, so I got the soundtrack there, but I did pre-order the score anyway because I also had the 7-inch and all that other stuff. I was like, ah, well, I guess I got to get the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Damn it, Mondo. Damn you, Mondo. You <laughs> got me you. again. Ooh, and Wednesday they're doing Return of Godzilla from, you know, Godzilla 84, oh, so. Yeah, damn, it's Godzilla Day. Yeah, Godzilla Day. You guys see that... Um and I don't want to talk too much about this because I think we have a lot to talk about, but um, shout TV is doing this big Godzilla marathon. Ooh. Um, so you can get a month free on your Roku for, for shout factory TV. And there's, and Wednesday they're doing a big Godzilla thon. So check that out. Um, have you guys seen antlers? Yes. No Korea. You got to get to the movies. Hey, okay. First of all, I want to talk about the new, no, no, no. You guys shut up. Have you seen the new slumber party massacre? I, I have not. I have ah, not. Ha ha. Fuck you, James. I saw a movie. You did it. That's new. <laughs> you need to go to the movies, James. Let's talk about the new Summer Party Massacre. That one, I won't go to the movies. Isn't that on? Is it on HBO Max? Or, sci-fi uh, channel. Sci-fi yeah, channel. It's sci-fi <laughs> channel. But you can rent it on video on demand. And, uh, and it's so, good. Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about that instead of Antlers for a moment. Uh, <laughs> the new Summer Party Massacre is, is a hell of a, is a lot of fun. Uh, Heather yeah. talked about it very highly uh, during our last episode. So I went out and rented it. It was like seven bucks and it's worth it, dude. That is a solid modern uh, part four. It's from the director who did uh, the Banana Splits uh, horror movie that came out a few oh, years yes. ago. And they, it, it's great because there's little nods to the original movies. You know, like at one point, one of the characters picks up a guitar that looks like the yeah. one from two. Um, but it was more so like how they played more so, more with uh, the tropes. So like Summer Party Massacre would play with stuff like, oh, here's a bunch of attractive girls in lingerie having pillow fights. And we're going to go over the top with it. Well, in this one, they had that happen with a bunch of half naked dudes. Yeah. <laughs> There was in particular a very glaring, uh, long and slow scene of a dude showering. Oh, yeah. It just like sudsing up all <laughs> over with his hands and stuff. But the but the pillow fight scene was they set it up perfectly because it starts off with the guys trying to see who could rip the pillow in half. And they're all struggling. They're like, Ugh, you know, trying to be all macho. And then when they finally do, they're like, ah, ha, ha, and then just start hitting each other with pillows. <laughs> It was utterly fantastic, but they, yeah, there, there were, you know, there was a few uh, acting choices that were a bit rough uh, and stuff. The Driller Killer was, you know, I it was one of the best impressions of the Driller Killer from the first movie I've ever seen since the first one. Um, but they did a lot of really fun uh, takes on toxic masculinity, modern day uh, toxic. Um, critiquing old school like tropes within these movies and whatnot and really playing around with everything and i liked uh mostly that it was like they were they were doing the tropey stuff but they're because i don't want to spoil too much but they were doing the tropes but they had a purpose like the characters were purposely doing this and so yeah i would highly recommend it. i think it's i think it functions well as like a part four you know oh yeah of the series all right can, can we talk about antlers now Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Antlers, uh, what'd you think, Jacob? I really liked it. Uh, it had, well, uh, just back step a second. Uh, I saw it at Beyond Fest, and, it, and so we got to see it introduced by Scott Cooper and Guillermo del Toro. And this, and yeah, I mean, it was only produced by Guillermo del Toro, and Scott Cooper has his own style. But when it comes to the monsters, it was pure del Toro. I, I was going to say, del Toro's thumbprint is all over oh, the yeah. damn movie. Big though. thumbprint. <laughs> all Big over thumbprint. It. Yeah, but so is Scott Cooper's though, because Scott oh, Cooper yeah, did yeah. Um, Black Mass and uh, Hostels. I mean, yeah. he's it, not really a horror filmmaker, but definitely a dark filmmaker. And Antlers is dark. 
Yeah, and uh, it was interesting because at the Q and A, even talked about how he wanted to make it as a uh, uh, drama that just also happens to be a horror movie because it deals with so many grounded and uh, horrible real life issues like drug addiction and poverty and child abuse, and yeah, it's it's just interesting how it kind of goes about because it it's like all these different threads. But that part. That, that was my, I, I, as a horror movie, I think it functions great. It's an amazing creature feature and that, you know, that monster is awesome. But oh, yeah. it's, it's the stuff you're talking about, the different drama threads that didn't quite land for me. Like, um, I, and the thing is, it's 97 minutes long, which is short by both Scott Cooper and Guillermo del Toro standards. So they could have tacked on another 20 minutes without it feeling bloated and really dug into like the drug addiction thread, the child abuse thread, you know, that kind of thing. Because in the end, it basically Carrie Russell plays a school teacher and one of her students is kind of weird and she suspects there's shit going down at home. And of course there is, but it's not what she suspects. And I didn't feel like I didn't buy why she was going out of her way to help this kid so much when they give you a little taste of it. And it's because she relates to him for some reason or a reason that they tell you. But I, I think they could have developed that better and really punched you in the gut with it. And I can't tell if it's the writing or just her acting in it. But I mean, as a horror movie, I think it's great, but I think it could have been so much more if they had just followed some of those drama threads a little better. Yeah, I feel like they kind of went a little bit ambiguous on some of that stuff, which I feel worked in some ways better than others. But yeah, no, th- I mean, we we were just there for the Wendigo, and that was a hell of a <laughs> Wendigo. Yeah, he is. Yeah, it, it, it's a great monster movie, but oh, yeah. I I think I expected more from. I mean, Guillermo del Toro is all about injecting the, human the drama, drama into. Yeah, exactly. Um, have either of you guys um, gotten over to? Uh, paramount plus for uh paranormal activity next of ken uh not yet no it, it you know Number party massacre was the only movie <laughs> <laughs> besides the, my hooptober titles <laughs> i checked out paranormal activity because i i mean i love the the franchise and it's on paramount plus so i was able to watch it and i kind of all of the paranormal activity movies including this one i think are better in theaters because they have so many scares that are based on being in the dark not just in the dark but with a crowd there's so many of those like volume based scares that when they happen you're all and then you you know the the whole audience you know there's so and there's a lot of those in this and they don't land when you're sitting on the couch next to your dog watching (laughs) you know they don't quite land the same yeah no because like i remember watching the original paranormal activity it was just such a communal experience just you know being there like you said in the dark and getting scared and then us all just kind of responding as a group so yeah i mean it's uh, i mean i haven't seen the movie itself but yeah it just feels like one of those things that it would probably work better as a theatrical release but the other thing about it, it it's directed by william eubank who is your buddy who did underwater oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's directed by him and the thing is it's a good movie it's not a good paranormal activity movie. I wish they had taken this story because it doesn't really have anything to do with the other paranormal activity movies. The paranormal activity movies, I mean, I've seen all of them in the theater just because it's such a great experience. And this one I wish I'd seen in the in the theaters because it's a similar style, meaning that it's like a found footage kind of a thing because they're making a documentary about this girl's family. And she did a 23 and Me and has a long lost brother who's an Amish guy. Hmm. And that's where it you know goes from there. Um, but also they break the fourth wall or not break the fourth wall. They they kind of, you know, let you behind the scenes because there are some shots that are not found footage like, the, you know, they'll have like, you know, handheld camera because her friend is a documentarian making this movie of her and they'll show like his camera footage and then they'll show like a drone shot above the car driving like a shining kind of thing. And you're like, so how is this found footage? You know, did he have a drone that he was flying mm. from the car? That's <laughs> pretty standard in the in the documentary, uh, you know, kit. I mean, it's especially especially nowadays, because you you throw in a drone shot, especially if you own your own drone and you can operate on your own. Dude, you're adding production value like a motherfucker. So I, I can buy that a little bit. The thing is, it, story wise, it's not even paranormal activity at all in fact i mean it's a good movie i wish it wasn't part of the paranormal activity i wish they had called it you know amish horror or whatever <laughs> you know i don't know what they would also, have called been it. a long time since there's been an amish horror movie <laughs> 
Like the last I can really think of is that uh, Deadly Blessing movie. Yeah, I was going to say Craven's Deadly Blessing. I mean, that's as much as I can remember. Yeah, not a lot of Amish horror. I mean, the music video for Weird Al's Amish oh, Paradise yeah, Amish was Paradise. pretty horrifying at times. <laughs> uh, that, that is a classic. I, I, I have a slightly related question, James. You claim to have watched all Paranormal Activity movies in theaters. Did you watch Ghost Dimension in 3D? Yes, I did. Ooh. How nauseous did you get? <laughs> I didn't really get nauseous, but the entire time I felt like I was having a Korea moment. And this is, I think, even before I had met you. Um, the whole time I'm and they do explain this in the movie, but it wasn't satisfactory to me. I'm like, OK, found footage 3D. Come yeah. on. <laughs> oh. And there's like supposedly there's a spirit camera. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, come on. Spirit I'm doing camera. I'm doing jerk off motions right now. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, because when they when that came out, I definitely had that reaction of three found footage and it's 3d yeah Yeah. but i I still i haven't watched the movie i I haven't watched past four but i do want to watch that movie but like just the idea of like that just i was like oh man how are people not going to throw up in the theater you need to watch the marked ones even probably before ghost dimension because that one one was actually pretty good marked ones is really good yeah it's 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 supposedly a spin-off it's a completely different family, but at yeah. least it's the same type of of an entity as the other paranormal activities. Hmm. Um, whereas um, Next of Kin is it, it's a completely different kind of a thing. Uh, OK, no spoilers. No, I, I will tell you, though, just one thing, Jacob, when you see it, there are some scenes that are going to absolutely terrify you. And I'll say it's similar to Blair Witch, oh. Not Blair Witch Project, Blair Witch. All right. Okay. So, you uh, so you definitely need to check it out because I, I watched that tonight. You'll you'll have fun with uh, okay, with you with know some me. Of it. <laughs> Praise on Jacob's fears of commitment. <laughs> well, commitment to haunted woods because you know I'm from New England, so I'm afraid I I have an instinctual fear of the woods because bad shit happens in the woods. We burn good so many happens witches in the, woods. in the woods. You know, yeah, nothing good happens in the woods. <laughs> oh, what was it? Uh, Lindsay and I watched uh, the Midnight Hour. Uh, an eight, it's this 80s TV. Yeah. Oh, movie yeah. I love with that. With Lamar Burton. Oh, yeah. Lamar Burton. That and, pro- uh, and Red from se- that 70s show. Okay. We didn't get to finish <laughs> it because we had to go to a 10 Candles live RPG. Uh, so, like, we're, we had like 20 minutes left, and we haven't seen him since the opening when the kid throws a, uh, a newspaper at him. And I so badly wanted him to say, say dumbass. But, <laughs> but that was, oh my God. That, like, that was, that's a perfect double feature with Hocus Pocus because it's just classic, like, New England. Yeah. Oh, we fucked up a witch long ago, and now we're getting <laughs> cursed with it. We actually yeah. watched it with, uh, Paranorman, uh, which was oh, a, that's a great great double too. feature. Can't go wrong with Paranorman. I haven't watched that in years, and god yeah. damn it, does that movie still hit hard? Oh, yeah. yeah, funny enough, they're actually doing a uh, anniversary screening for the 10th anniversary of Leica as a Fathom Events thing uh, on the 16th. So I'm going to see it in theaters again. Oh, fuck yeah. That's awesome. What else you guys been seeing? Well, I wanted to mention some of the big stuff I did in October, and one of the biggest, of course, was the return of the Arrow Horrorthon, including Korngorn, the living god, who had to fight his new arch nemesis, Christopher Lambert. Uh, and that's Christopher Lamb is in the Lamb and Bears and Bear is like a hybrid that he had to fight to the death. Because, yeah, like, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Arrow Horathon is an annual horror movie marathon they do at the Arrow Theater in Santa Monica every year in October. And there's all these different characters and running gags and inside jokes. So it was just got really great after, uh, you know, with the lock and everything last year for it to come back in stride. And it was a great lineup this year, too. We had uh, In the Mouth of Madness on 35 millimeter, It's Alive on 35 millimeter, uh, New DCP of Night Beast. Uh, House of Wax 2005 and 35 millimeter Horror Express and 35 millimeter and the brain with David Gale in a new DCP restoration. Ooh. So uh, I worked that night, but I did get to sit in for most of the movies and it was just a blast, especially Night Beast. Like people were just having a ball with how ridiculous Night Beast was. Don't even front. You know, you were Lamb Bear. What? What do you mean? You say you had to work that night, but you were Lamb Bear. I was not Christopher Lamb Bear. <laughs> Christopher Lamb Bear. But would no. it have been good as Lamb Pig? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, well, the joke was that it was also an advertisement for uh, Highlander 2 Pig in the City. Babe Pig in the City has one of the most terrifying scenes in cinematic history 
when those animals are getting rounded up in the hotel and it still fucking haunts me. Yeah, George Miller went really hard on that sequel. He did. Like, it, and, it, it, and until Mad Max Fury Road, it was the most hard Delwyn went on a sequel. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, but yeah, so I was glad the horrorthon was back. And um, let's see, uh, I also did a 70s uh, horrorthon uh, at the Dynasty Typewriter as a part of, um, let's see, uh, Friday Night Frights, uh, you know, that, and uh, S- Secret 16. And uh, let's see, that one was uh, The Evictors, Terror, The Hills Have Eyes, Blood and Lace, Shock, and Tourist Trap on 16 millimeter. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I mean, I saw a couple of those I had already seen before uh, in theatrically, but uh, Terror and Blood and Lace, I feel in particular, really blasted away the crowd. That, that stuff was bananas. And uh, the other big thing, of course, was uh, Beyond Fest. Uh, I was both working and attending a, a bunch of Beyond Fest events like VHS 94, New York Ninja, Mad God, Black Phone. Yeah, it was, again, it's just really great this uh, this October that so, so many, uh, you know, annual events uh, return, you know, in theaters or, or, you know, like in person. Did you see Black Phone? I did. How is it? I can't wait for that. Oh, it is good as hell. Oh, I cannot wait for Black Phone. Yeah. And it's oh, not coming out until next year, right? I mean, you January. saw it like months early. Yeah. Like January, February. Yeah. Can't wait. Oh, no, trust me. It's, it's going to be well worth it. Nice. And uh, avoid the trailers and commercials if you can. Like, try and go in as blind as possible. I always do. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I try not to watch them. Have either of you guys seen The Eternals? Or I guess it's just Eternals. Uh, no, I, I, I thought that wasn't out yet. It's it's not. I, I saw a presser of it, and I don't know if either of you guys uh, okay. saw previews of no. it. Um, it's actually pretty cool. As a Marvel movie, it's getting a lot of hate. And I can't quite figure out why, because it's just a regular Marvel movie. I mean, it's, it's if you like Marvel movies, you're going to like Eternals. Um, what struck me most about it is it's really, really diverse. And, you know, the, the Eternals themselves and, you know, of course, the Avengers, you know, you know, that they, they had, you know, uh, War Machine and Falcon, you know, they, you know, they, they had their racial diversity in the Avengers. This they've got racial. There, there's a Hispanic, you know, uh, eternal there's an asian eternal there's an african-american eternal but also one of them is deaf and one of them is gay so you're like okay they're they're really going for it and it's it's really awesome you know i mean i avengers they threw in a a a gay like background character and everybody's like oh oh, the first gay marvel character eternals has an actual gay marvel character (laughs) About time. It's pretty good. I mean, it's it it doesn't. They mention Thanos and the snap, so you know it's in the same universe. But it doesn't really have anything to do with the other Marvel movies. I mean, like you, you don't have Spider Man swinging in and joining the fight. You know, it's it's its own thing. But gotcha. it's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of interested because you know it's like it was based off of the Jack Kirby comic, and like that that type of stuff is more fantastical and kind of, and kind of. Uh, out of genre outside of superheroes it's, it's getting a lot of hate and i don't know why because it's pretty much a typical marvel movie but one thing i will say that i was kind of bummed about that chloe Zhao directed it who did yeah. nomad land yeah you can't tell that she directed it. there's a couple mm. scenes that take place in like south dakota where you're like okay this could be a chloe Zhao movie but otherwise you're like this is her i don't feel like her her stamp is on this movie, which is bummer because I really was looking forward to what she was going to do with a Marvel movie. And I don't think she took it and ran with it. Like Dustin Daniel Crenton did with Shang-Chi, you know, gotcha. like he, 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 you know, you can tell that's a Dustin Daniel Crenton movie. You can't really tell this is a Chloe Zhao movie. But would you say it's still worth seeing in theaters? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a Marvel movie. It's a spectacle movie. Yeah. Go see it in theaters. If you, I mean, if you feel up to it, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say, go to a theater to anyone because I mean, I went to a press screening with, and there were like 10 other people. (laughs) Not everyone can do that. Uh, Sort of related. Did anyone else see Dune? Yeah. I saw that in IMAX. It blew me away. Dude is it's funny. Dune. I I mean, it's, it's not really my thing. You know, I mean, I love science fiction, but it's, it, it's not my thing. It's a beautifully made movie. Um, like I knew it would be with Denny Villeneuve. It's just a wonderfully yeah. made movie. One thing I think that deserves to be spoiled, although everybody knows this by now anyway, it's part one. 
So you, it's two hours and 37 minutes and it's only half a movie. <laughs> but it says that from the opening title card. It says Dune Part 1. So it's not really a spoiler anyway. And they did uh, they did green light too. So that is going to happen. Like they weren't going to. The, the opening yeah, title card said Dune Part 1. What were they going to do? Oh, not enough people saw this. We're not doing a part two. <laughs> hey, I mean, there was some worry. That would have been a dick move for them to only give you half the movie. It oh, is, yeah. you know, I mean, as a movie, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a good, speaking of spectacle movies, like you said, it's a good spectacle movie. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Dune story. I mean, although I would see Yodorovsky's Dune if he got a chance oh, yeah. to make it in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. But that's what this kind of feels like. This feels closer to what Yodorovsky was doing than what David Lynch ended up doing. Um, because again, you know, two and a half hours and it's only half the movie, <laughs> you know. Yep. Um, let's see. And uh, got yeah, there's a lot, a lot of great the uh, repertory screenings in October. Like I also got to see uh, Michael Mann's The Keep in theaters at Brain Dead Studios, which I had done, but that was eight years ago. So I was really happy somebody else was playing it again. I was gonna say that is that like a bucket list thing for you to see that as many times as you can? <laughs> yes, that's one of your movies. It is. And it's still just as uh, mind blowing as it is uh, when I first saw it. Uh, granted, though, uh, when I saw it eight years ago, it was on film from like this rare British print, and this was a DCP. But um, I mean, I you know I'm just glad I got the opportunity, and uh, yeah, and it was uh, it was kind of uh, funny because. Uh, I saw that film print version of the keep at Cine Family, which is now Brain Dead Studios. So it was like the same menu, different venue. They're same location, different venue. And yeah, no, it's just such an um, just such a fascinating movie, especially uh, you know we're talking about Jodorowsky's Dune because originally Michael Mann's version was going to be over two hours long, and then the studio took it from him and you know kind of edited it around. And but you know, and despite and it is a flawed movie for sure, but despite that, you know, just such has such an amazing soundtrack and visuals and cast. So it's it's just very enthralling, you know. Sometimes the flaws are the best parts. Hmm. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> cool. We have a very special guest this week. Um, we have cinematographer Anka Malatinska. Did I get that close? You got it right. Got it right. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't, but you're being nice. How you doing, Anka? I'm great. How are you? We're doing great. Anka is the cinematographer um, right now of the Amazon Prime show, uh, I Know What You Did Last Summer. That's the big thing that, that she's got out now, among other things that we'll talk about. Um, a question I always like to lead off with, with our guests is, how did you get started? I mean, did you go to film school? How did you get started being a director of photography? I went to film school. I went to two film schools. I actually went to NYU, and then I went to AFI a number of years later. I went into NYU studying documentary photography, and then like, and studying photography and then like the technical end of the photography kind of really sucked me in. And there, it felt like there was, there was nowhere to progress in still photography, kind of in expanding what you can do with it. I was also, you know, like all my life obsessed with travel. And I think ever since I was a little kid, I identified photography as as a way of being able to travel, as a way of being able to see into worlds that I would otherwise not be able to see. And then kind of, you know, I fell in love with lighting. I fell in love with cameras and lenses. And to me, you know, telling a narrative, is like traveling. It's like traveling into a book. All three of us have also gone to film school. And I know so many people who went to film school wanting to be a director who come out a cinematographer for exactly the reasons that you're talking about. They fall in love with the visuals of it and lighting and, you know, stuff like that. So I, I think that um, that's a pretty common way to become a cin cinematographer. I think, <laughs> are you a, a big, have you always been a horror fan? Um, you know, I don't know that I've always been a, I've always been a psychological horror. The, you know, kind of, I, I think a lot of Monster Land did. Like, that's the kind of horror that I love, um, where it's really like telling a much deeper story 
through allegory, so to speak. And then when I started shooting horror, horror, like I, I am, I love horror, fantasy, sci-fi, um, because all of those things allow me to be really expressive with the lighting and visuals. Um, so, yeah. And in terms of her, uh, you've been working on I Know What You Did Last Summer. Uh, did you see the original I Know What You Did Last Summer uh, when it came out? And what did you think about it? How did you feel working on this new version? Um, so I really, like, I watched I Know What You Did Last Summer years ago. Um uh, you know, and it wasn't like a hard hitting movie for me. What I was really attracted to was Sarah's scripts and Sarah's take on the story, you know, which much like Monsterland, you know, I felt like had a lot of allegory and reality that young people are going through today, basically, you know, facing fucked up situations while the adults in their world have completely abandoned them. And then there is like the weaving of like, how do we, it, you know, what is morality within that? What is right or wrong or wrong, and who's going crazy? I love that when we were shooting, nobody knew who the killer was. I know nobody right now still knows who the killer was because we're two episodes down, but it is, it's actually really fun to rewatch when you know who the k- killer was. Oh, so no spoils, please. No spoils. <laughs> no, I can't tell you. Could be anyone. Now it's it's kind of interesting because when when I know what you did last summer, the original came out, it was like hot on the heels of Scream and it was around like urban legend and the faculty. There was this big push towards hip 90s teen horror. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes sense to me that it wound up as a TV miniseries or TV series because there's a push for that hip horror teen TV, you know, with like stuff i mean like teen wolf or supernatural you know all that kind of it seems like that's where everything has moved i noticed in i know in in the tv i know you did last time which you did some of the some of the photography is kind of similar especially like with the night shots you know like particularly the scene where they actually kill the person which is in the first episode. So that's not a spoiler. And if you've seen the original, um, was that like a conscious thing? Were you saying, okay, we're going to kind of pay tribute or is it just that that's what that would look like <laughs> on that road at night? You know, it's interesting. It's like, uh, you know, this is where I feel like, like sometimes these inspirations like come in really subconsciously. I think um, Craig McNeil, who directed the pilot and Sarah chose the location because it it emanated like that same kind of feel. Um, uh, And then, you know, I remember when I got there and I saw the location and it's like miles, you know, and miles of cliffside with no motivation for light with no like you know and then also a desire I think from Sarah and from the show and from Craig to make it feel to make it feel more real and grounded rather than like you know horror gothic you know so that it's it's it lives in this like Instagram millennial generation and world. Um, And I remember watching, you know, I remember like kind of like, you know, how are we going to get any big wide shots, you know, and I remember watching um, uh, the original then and the cinematographer did all of his driving wide shots at dusk and um, and then like, you know, came in and lit the close ups and the car stuff looked like it was both, you know, broken out to a stage and in the car and that kind of, you know, that that actually really guided the way for me on how to approach that. So yes, one definitely influenced the other. Now this, when you say Sarah, you're talking Sarah Goodman, the creator and writer of it, but there were other writers who also, you know, kind of popped in. I don't know how much they did, but there also are a lot, how many different directors were there? Five directors, six directors. There were three directors. Only three. Okay. I thought there were more. And I worked with two of them. Okay, because my my question was kind of being with that many with that many cooks in the kitchen photographically, is it up to you to make it a cohesive look basically to the to the story or is it or does that come from the script? 
Um, you know, there were definitely a lot of voices and a lot of divergent opinions and, you know, kind of a lot of also a lot of producers, a lot of higher ups who are also involved, attached, you know, producers from the past and everybody really like wanted to have a say and an opinion, Um, you know, and in the end for me as a cinematographer, it's kind of to take in everybody's voices, you know, and somehow, you know, and I feel like this is what happens at a really intuitive level is to funnel those desires basically, you know, through my eye and instinctual, you know, storytelling, um, while also like honing the energy of the rest of of the camera operators, of the gaffer, you know, it's all like, it's all a collaboration. Um, And then, you know, and I feel like, yes, it is like part of my job to keep the cohesiveness, like once we get on that train and we know what we're doing, you know, and then it's also interesting when you have an alternating DP come in or, you know, you have different directors come in and they change the language of the show. Um, You know, in the end, like what I often hear from people is that, you know, that that my eye is unique. I don't know, like, I don't really know how to quantify that or qualify that. I think every eye is unique, you know, and it is actually through the vehicle of that cinematographer that you, of that cinematographer, of that production designer, and of those directors that come in and contribute new ideas to a show. Your eye is unique, but did you find having all of the other voices diluting that or did it sharpen it? Um, In the beginning of the process, it, it felt like it was diluting that, you know, and then I feel like through the process of making the show, it got focused into, into the show that like it really wanted to be. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of data processing of different, you know, takes and different things. And uh, like you said, funneling it into it. Uh, how how different is that? Well, it's got to be super different than doing a, an anthology series like Monsterland, where it's not only different directors, but different stories, different takes, different, uh, you know, uh, scenarios that you can do. You can diverge very differently from episode to episode, but also kind of keep it in that funnel, you know, that so that it still feels like an episode of Monsterland. What was that challenge like? Like that must have been very different than keeping one cohesive over of course it was well, I think, you know, and like me and the other cinematographer decided, you know, that there were certain things that we would repeat, like a side light, like the use of smoke, like we were using the same lenses. Um, and then we were using the same color palette in lighting and we had the same production designer. So that in itself lays out a certain framework. You know, I think also Monsterland was really amazing and unique in the way that, you know, they they sought out indie directors for their vision and then they let them do their vision, you know, and the network was forewarned that you know, we may not cover things traditionally, you know, some things may be one shot. So you're living in a very different world, you know, and it's much more like monster land to me. Like, I feel like Mary Laws, the showrunner had a very specific vision that started photographically in um, Gregory Crudson and Todd Hito photography. And that was like, and from there we built the look of the show. Um, And then every director got to come in and have their own take on this visual language. Um, So it was it was awesome. It was, you know, wild to prep basically a little feature (laughs) um, for 10 days and then shoot it for 10 days. And then, you know, I think our final episodes got cut down to like seven days. Um, So it was a wild, exhausting ride. But I, I met some amazing directors who actually then, you know, resulted in me working. And I know what you did last summer. I have a question that's kind of a looking behind the curtain kind of a thing. The basic skeleton of I Know What You Did Last Summer is the same as the movie, but there's other things that are different. And one of them is there's there's a pair of twins. 
And they're both played by Madison Isman. So they're the same girl playing them. And a lot of that you can see is done through, through editing, but there's also parts of it where they do like that Brady bunch thing where you show both of them in the same shot. How'd you do that? Was it split screen? Was it, how, how, how did you get the same girl to play two parts on the same shot? Um, it's, it's through visual effects. So every time you see one of those shots, it's actually shot three times. Um, it's shot with one girl. Um, and that's including like the steady cam walking back. And that's kind of, you know, an ode to what we can do with visual effects now that we're repeating, you know, we're, we have almost exactly the same start and then we're repeating that shot. And then we're repeating that shot with Madison as the other girl. Sometimes that doesn't take place till later in the day. So we're also like recording marks on the floor where we started that shot, what height the camera was at. And then we also have a like an overlay screen where we can kind of, you know, blend the shot we shot earlier with the shot we're shooting now so we can make sure it lines up and we're making room for the girls where they need to be. Um, Then you always have to have a plate shot. And at the party, you know, there was a clean plate shot and then there was also a crowd plate shot. So it was a bit more complicated than just uh, complicated. Sh- shooting half the room and the other half the room, <laughs> like the yeah. Brady Bunch did it. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like every time, like, you know, it's like um, why they kill the twins after the first couple of episodes, you know, in any of these shows, because there are other twin shows out there. Um, <laughs> um, it, I think, you know, it, it costs a lot of time. I mean, I'm not saying like, that's not why Sarah wrote it, but (laughs) that way. (laughs) Well, I mean, it also makes sense. Yeah. And I did want to ask um, just in terms of, uh, I know what you did last summer and talking earlier about the original uh, and just kind of, how did you go about kind of uh, adapting, you know, because like that, like we were saying before, like that was one of those kind of hip teen horror movies of the 90s. And now it's a hip teen horror series for the 2020s uh how how do you think uh you adapted to that uh, kind of aesthetic um you know well i've i've shot a you know i've shot a lot of commercials in the past and i do feel like this is like brighter kind of i i also do feel like you know i Sorry, Amazon, but I do feel like it's brighter when I watch it now than it was at the final color correction. And I was talking to the colorist um, uh, and he was like, yeah, you know, I think Amazon always screens their stuff a little bit brighter. Um, But, you know, in a way I like. I feel like it's all there, everything that like all of those voices desired in a way. And in a way to me, like now when I watch it, I'm like, you know, it it almost like sometimes has a 90s aesthetic to it in some of it. Like, uh, yeah, in using, you know, a little bit more fill light than, you know, I would on Monsterland than I would on the show that I'm on now, you know, like you see the original and it's night, but you see everybody very clearly, you know, and um, it, it's in the middle of nowhere, but we we know where we are. We're not we're not an indie movie, you know, in total darkness We're, you know, we're a more I would say mainstream aesthetic in some ways. So Annette was even darker in a theater than it is on Amazon prime. <laughs> Cause that's a uh, dark movie. I don't know if you've seen Annette, the, uh, the Leos Carex uh, sparks movie. No, I oh, okay. not. Oh, we're, we're, we're big fans. At least Korea and I are I big fans. Out, yeah. Are you Jacob? Uh, you to be honest, it? I haven't seen it yet. Okay. You, oh, you, you, you should have seen Annette. It's on my, it's on my list. Don't don't make me start ranting about sparks now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> so, what is uh, what's next uh, for you, Anka? I know that you're filming a TV show. Can't talk about, but do you have uh, other projects that are coming up soon? Uh, something that uh, we can keep an eye out for as well. 
Um, you know, I recently collaborated with Steve Buscemi and Tessa Thompson on a very interesting indie that was, um, we shot it in six days, all in one location. And it's, um, uh, it's a suicide hotline worker, um, working all night, um, and taking phone calls and through the phone calls, we kind of piece together her life. Um, and why she does what she does. It doesn't have any flashbacks. It um, We shot it in large format on the Panavision DXL camera in 8K. We shot with these old rehoused Leica lenses that, um, you know, just had so much richness and character. Um, and it's like, a, you know, it's like a one- one person play with Tessa Thompson, who was absolutely amazing. Visually, I'm super, super excited about it. Um, and like I kept telling Steve that, you know, we're to me, it's an Eastern European film about L.A., which is something like it doesn't like there's no giant crescendo and there's no redemption really other than the sunrise visually there's no like um it's like a christopher kislowski film is it all take place in one room it takes place in one apartment have you seen the guilty i have heard of the guilty well, well there's two the guilties um i i haven't seen the new one the jake gyllenhaal one the american remake but i think it's an austrian movie from a few years ago it's, it's also called The Guilty, but it's about a, um, a 911 operator or whatever it is in Austria. Jake Gyllenhaal is a 911 operator, and he's piecing together this crime. And there are other actors in it because it does cut to other scenes, but most of it is him on a call. And it's it's terrific. I mean, the, the Austrian one is terrific. I think it's Austrian. Um, I haven't seen the American remake, though, but I love movies like that. Have you seen Locke? I have yes. Tom Hardy driving. <laughs> That's the ultimate right there. No, actually, the ultimate is uh, was it Ryan? Uh, was it Ryan Reynolds or Ryan, Ryan Reynolds? In yeah, when he was, yeah, when he's buried alive. <laughs> yeah, that was the ultimate. But but Locke is pretty close to a second. It's a pretty close second. And what was it like shooting that being entirely one location? Um, you know, it was a very different process from anything that. I've, I've worked on recently. It was a completely actor driven process. Um, Steve and I sat down and we went through the script and we kind of talked about, you know, made a framework for where she would go. And, um, you know, I remember at one point, um, one of the producers was like, Steve, do you know, like, you know, can you cut some shots tomorrow? Do you, uh, you like, can you simplify the blocking? And Steve's like, well, I, I like, we haven't done it with Tessa. No, like we got to explore. We have to let her move freely through the space. I can make my suggestions, but we'll know what we're doing when we get there. It was, you know, like, so we had a framework of shots, but it also demanded that I was super ad adaptable, um, uh, you know, to to like finding the shots in the moment and and steve was a dream collaborator you know i think after the last the first couple of setups i remember i was showing him something it was like you want to look at this through the viewfinder and he was like you know what you haven't steered me wrong yet so just keep doing what you're doing so it was also like I mean, in a way, it was like playing jazz with steve buscemi and tessa thompson and um and and we got some spectacular spectacular cinematography in there are they long takes yes they were all long so yeah. so it's kind of like you were photographing a play kind of basically yes in a way okay but giving it like um you know more cinematic life than but it was like she was on the like we broke it up into you know basically phone conversations the longest phone conversation was 20 minutes long and it was broken up into three parts based on kind of the locations she eventually she goes outside of the house like so there are different visual environments that she walks into yeah and it's one camera it wasn't like a like a tv show no, setup or it was two cameras oh two okay we shot two minutes. Yeah. So you just let her go then. That's great. 
and and then like sometimes like you know we did a combination of like you know dolly shots and um and two cameras and then single camera um and um steve it was interesting because steve was kind of reserved on wanting to use steady cam from an actor's perspective he was like you know like having that thing in front of you when you're acting is just so distracting um but going handheld isn't as distracting um and and you know we actually we had an issue with our we like i talked him into one steady cam shot and then we had an issue with the steady cam and i ended up doing the shot handheld anyway i did a bunch of handheld stuff in there and i would operate the handheld um uh, yeah and i could tell you guys about that if you ever want to hear about it <laughs> oh, well, of that actually <laughs> kind of does bring up something I, when i was watching uh, i know what you did last summer is a lot of that handheld or steady cam. It looks like there's always camera motion, sort of like um, it's kind of a new thing that horror directors do. Like, have you seen The Strangers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That it, I think every shot is handheld in that. And what it does is it it never lets the audience relax. It just always keeps them. And they don't quite know why, because they don't understand that this camera is like slightly moving the whole time. Was how much of it was handheld like that? So, you know, like the our our first director really like wanted to emulate a lot of Andrea Arnold and handheld, you know, Craig wanted a really kind of free documentary camera, um, which like, you know, almost calls for a single camera, but it's really difficult to do that with an ensemble cast and also, you know, in a bigger studio system that, also desires coverage and they do, you know, and they will tell us that they want coverage. Right. Um, you know, and it's also understandable, you know, with balancing a cast and balancing performances. And then I think ultimately, you know, balancing all the voices from from the top, you know, like for me watching showrunners work in television, like, you know, when we're on set, we think that the showrunner is our boss, but the showrunner actually has like a room of bosses that we never have to interface with who give them notes all the time. Um, So, you know, like that style also transitioned and I think appropriately so to us sometimes actually landing the camera. Um, And then the director of episode five and six completely landed the camera. Um, I think there's just a little bit of handheld. There are only a couple of scenes. So yeah, I'm I'm not up to that part yet. So so I, I I'm still seeing the handheld stuff. Um I but you brought up something when you say there's a room of people above the showrunner, you know, it that it, it kind of makes me wonder how different is the actual show that hits prime from what you envisioned when you were shooting it? I mean, how, once it goes through all the filters, is it completely different or is you like, this is pretty close to what I envisioned? Um, it depends on the show. Um, I think on this, uh, I think on this show, you know, I, I think, I, you know, originally I thought it was going to be a lot darker and moodier. And then um, and then because we were shooting in Hawaii, we got notes that they really like want it to feel sunny and they want it to feel like it's in Hawaii, which I feel like through the eight episodes of the show, like by the last episode, I kind of like got the shadows richer and leaned into the darkness more. Um, and there were also scenes that like, I mean, I know there's a lot of darkness in the cave, but then like when we go outside, um, so I think I also, you know, working with Craig McNeil, when I worked with him on Monsterland and kind of knowing him as a director, I had originally expected a lot of like, you know, like, I feel like, you know, his camera has always been really, really intentional and and creepy and grounded even when he went handheld a lot in the boy there's definite like kind of and he really wanted to embrace a lot of handheld in the beginning um and then you know marrying that with horror i in the end 
I love what we did and I love the way the show grew visually over the eight episodes. Um, but I think from the get go, it was different from what I envisioned when I like first, you know, because I envisioned dark, rainy Hawaii, which it exists, you know, and and we leaned into that in the later episodes. But I do feel like it's still brighter on Amazon. <laughs> it probably is. All right. Um, well, great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Anka and everybody watch. I know what you did last summer on Amazon um, and and watch it. Uh, turn the brightness down on your TV when you watch it. <laughs> uh, put, it put it in cinematic mode. <laughs> yes, put it in cinematic mode. <laughs> but turn motion smoothing off. Um, <laughs> Always. <laughs> where can people uh, if they do you have a social media if they want to keep up with what you're doing? Um, you can find me on Instagram at OncaVision. Or, um, great or handle. my website is oncovision.com. Okay, great. Um, and, and if you are curious about any of your projects, I'm sure on IMDb as well. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for joining us, um, on this Monday evening and, and you, you've got to get up early and shoot. So we appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you guys so much. Our, uh, our music is is by restless spirits so go check them out um our artwork is by chris fisher so go check him out um you can find us at the eye on horror twitter facebook instagram uh letterbox you can find us at ihorror.com and anywhere else where you get your horror news <laughs> and um we will see you in a couple of weeks so for me james j edwards i'm jacob davison i'm jonathan korea i'm on kamala Zinska. keep your eye on horror